One time in high school physics, we were working on this group project where we had to design a parachute to try to keep an egg from cracking. Our teacher Mrs. Russell was going to drop our structures off the top of the main staircase in the school, and whichever group's egg survived would get a few points extra credit on the project. We were supposed to use household objects and had to write up a report and answer a few questions about our designs, but overall it was just supposed to be a fun activity. Each group had three people, and I was lucky enough to be working with my best friend Kyle. Our other group member was a slightly weird kid named Alex. Kyle and I didn't know that much about him, but he had a reputation for giving bizarre answers in class and just laughing at random moments. I won't go over all the project instructions, but basically each person had to bring two items from home that they thought could help make the parachute and hold the egg. They weren't supposed to be expensive or irreplaceable, and Mrs. Russell said each group could also use a certain amount of tape. The three of us started to discuss what kinds of things we should bring in, and eventually agreed that I would bring in paper towels and a garbage bag, while Kyle would get a spool of string and a sponge. Alex agreed to bring the stapler, but didn't want to tell us what the other item was. Kyle and I asked him several times, but Alex would just laugh awkwardly and say it was a surprise. It was kind of annoying, but as we figured we already had enough stuff, Kyle and I didn't really care. The next day we began working on the project at the start of class, and the whole room erupted in laughter the moment they saw what Kyle had brought in. It was a bra. Looking back now, that was actually a based and really good idea, but in the moment Kyle and I were kind of embarrassed. Mrs. Russell came over and did her best to get people to settle down as she asked Kyle a few awkward questions, but everyone found his responses to be hilarious as well. She eventually determined that the article of clothing didn't belong to Alex, and as he hadn't obtained permission from its owner, we couldn't use it in our project. At this point, we just wanted Alex to stop talking, but he insisted that this wasn't fair since our group would only have five objects instead of six. Mrs. Russell tried to come up with something, and then said we could go as a group and pick out one additional item from the art supplies room in the basement, but that we had to be back in five minutes. Kyle and I were on board with that idea, and as everyone continued to snicker, we walked out of the door. Dude, Kyle said when we got into the hallway. Alex just laughed, and I motioned for Kyle to let it go, since I didn't think that would have any effect on him. The building we were in had three floors including the basement level, and we were on the top floor so we made our way over to the main staircase. The art classroom was in another part of the building, and you had to take another staircase to get to the supply room which was right beneath it. When we got to the first floor, Alex randomly blurted out that he had to use the bathroom and started walking in that direction. Kyle and I didn't mind, since it was nice to not be around him for a while, and we continued walking over to the art room laughing at how dumb the situation was. When we got there, we turned and went down the narrow staircase leading to the supply room. Kyle and I had been down here before, as had almost everyone in our high school, and it was kind of a running joke that our art teacher constantly sent kids down during class to get supplies. I'm pretty sure it served as a supply room for more than just art class, as there was some gym equipment like basketballs and a parachute as well. We reached the bottom of the stairs and opened the door into pitch blackness, and a second later found the light switch. Most of what was down here was reams of paper, but there were also random objects as the art teacher was a fan of so-called mixed media and would try to have us incorporate them into our art. For example, there were those reflectors you see on roads, as well as egg cartons, aluminum cans, and gerbil tubes. Kyle and I decided to look for something soft that could serve as extra cushioning, but not even 10 seconds after entering the room, Kyle shushed me. Dude, did you hear that? I didn't hear it at first but then I picked up on a low, scratching, scraping type sound. It sounded like an animal, but it was also like something hitting metal. It was coming from the opposite end of the room, and naturally we walked over out of curiosity. I should mention that this entire room was about half the size of a classroom, and with everything stacked up against the walls, it wasn't like there were a lot of places for someone to hide and jump out at us. Why would someone even do that anyway? Therefore, Kyle and I weren't scared, but that changed in a heartbeat. We got to the other side where some large picture frames were leaning against the wall and realized it was something in the vent. I picked up the frames and slid them over, expecting to see a mouse, but instead I saw something that is now forever burned into my retinas. On the other side of the grate was the head of a man. He was bald and looked like he was in his mid-fifties. The moment I uncovered him, he looked at me and screamed at the top of his lungs. Kyle and I screamed too, and ran back up those stairs faster than any other time in our lives. 
People in the art class heard the commotion, and our art teacher, Mrs. Sandra, actually came out and started telling us to be quiet. But when she saw us literally running for our lives, she became concerned, and we explained as best we could about what the hell we just saw. A few of the kids in our class started coming out of the room, as well as people from other classrooms, and in no time it turned into this whole big scene. Our campus police officer called for backup before going down the stairs with one of the other teachers. Two minutes later he came back up, and told us that no one was there. Now, you might think that everyone thought Kyle and I were just pulling a prank, but it seemed like pretty much everyone took us seriously. Apparently the grate was still screwed on, meaning the guy had been crawling through the ductwork, but even after looking at the blueprints, school officials weren't sure exactly where all the ducts led. There were a few possible points of entry, but it wasn't clear which one the man might have used. Our school only had cameras by the main entrances and not the air conditioning areas, so he was never caught on camera. I still think about this from time to time, if not because of how scary it was, then because of how random and bizarre it was. That includes the fact that the only reason we went down there in the first place was because this kid in our group decided to bring in a bra for our project. Obviously I wonder about who the hell that man was, how he got in, and what he was doing there. I assume he was trying to break into the school, but to do what exactly, I have no idea. I'm just glad those screws held the grate in place, and he didn't come running after us. Back in college I took this fashion design class one semester because I needed an elective and it worked out with my schedule. The class was focused on sewing and using other equipment to make basic types of clothing. Low key, it was kind of fun. There were only like 7 or 8 of us in the class, and though I was the only student on the fashion design program, I got along with the people decently well. There were these two girls that would always talk to each other non-stop, and to me they gave off slightly weird vibes, but it really didn't matter. Our final project was to use the skills we learned to make a bra, and when I mentioned this to some of my friends, they found it rather amusing. It had become a kind of inside joke that I was taking this class this semester, mostly because I wasn't big on fashion and didn't seem like the type of person to study fashion. Anyway, it was our second to last class and I was trying to find suitable pieces of fabric out of a stack of supplies. We met in this largest room that had sewing and pressing machines and a few other pieces of equipment, and there were a few random piles of fabric left over from old projects. Our teacher, Mrs. Yancey, wasn't the most organized, but again, it really didn't matter. Halfway through picking out my pieces of fabric, the two girls took an interest in what I was doing and walked over. They started joking between each other and began a running commentary on every single piece I was looking at. One of the things they brought up was the fact that as someone who didn't wear bras, making one might be tricky for me. It honestly got annoying pretty quick, but since our class was winding down, I tried not to care. Eventually I picked out what I thought would be enough pieces and walked back over to one of the tables with the sewing machines and began to trim the fabric. The two girls sat at the adjacent table and continued to narrate everything I was doing. The other people in the class took notice as well, and another girl even tried to stick up for me and joke with them that they should stop harassing me and get to work making their own bras. Thankfully that seemed to work, and though the two girls kept talking non-stop, they at least moved on to another topic. After an hour or so of work, I was reasonably pleased with what I'd created. Like I said, this class was super chill, and there was basically no way I wasn't going to get an A. Each of us took our bra over to Miss Yancey for her to inspect, and she basically told us we did great jobs and everybody did fine in the class. After she inspected my bra, I walked back to where I had been working and started cleaning up the stray bits of fabric. But now this is where things were about to get stranger than I ever expected. The two girls approached me, quietly this time, and then each of them complimented my bra. It actually took me by surprise, and I think I said something like, hey thanks. Without remarking on physical appearances, I'll say I didn't have a girlfriend at this point but would not be interested in pursuing a relationship with either of these two women. Therefore, I didn't really want to continue this conversation and was content to let things drop. But then one of the girls, who I'll call Lauren, said she was impressed with what I'd made during the class and asked if I wanted to come over to their apartment and see their collection of handmade clothing. That took me so off guard that I had no idea what to say. I really didn't want to go to their apartment, and I tried my best to think of an excuse. That's when the other girl, who I'll call Janet, insisted that it would only take five minutes, and then she and Lauren exchanged glances. 
I'm not sure what they meant by that look, but it seemed weird. Now maybe I'm just too nice of a guy, because I actually asked them where their apartment was. Still looking at each other, they both began to smile, and I instantly regretted that decision. They gave me an address that was a few blocks from campus, and incidentally, not in a good neighborhood. They told me to come by around 8, and I tried my best to be cordial and tell them I'd see them then. After walking out the door, I began texting my friend group about that extremely weird conversation. A lot of jokes were made, some involving bras, and one or two of my friends began insisting they were part of some cult and were trying to induct me. I texted back, lol you guys gotta save me, and my friend Taj actually volunteered to come with me later that evening. The group immediately agreed that was a good idea, and said we needed to give them a full report after we went there. Taj met up with me in my dorm room around 7.30, and we laughed about the situation with my roommate Kevin, who was part of the group chat. A few minutes later, Taj and I left and began walking across campus. We started off trying to catch up with each other, but the conversation quickly shifted to how sketchy the area was. You're gonna get us kidnapped over some bra, Taj joked, but low-key I think we both wanted to turn back. Eventually we arrived at the apartment building, which had staircases on the outside leading up to each of the apartments. It was also dimly lit, gave off unsettling vibes. Had Lauren and Janet's apartment not been on the first floor, we honestly probably would have turned back before walking up to the door. We stepped onto the front porch and I knocked on the door. There wasn't an answer, though the curtains were closed, it didn't look like any of the lights were on. Taj rolled his eyes and said, hell nah. But just as I was about to knock again, all the lights seemed to turn on at once, and I heard footsteps coming towards the door. Who is it? A woman said, but it didn't sound like either Lauren or Janet, and there was something very off-putting in the voice. It almost sounded like the person was delivering a line from a play. I looked at Taj, who slowly started to shake his head. I figured I'd say one more thing before we noped out of this now extremely sketchy situation. Do Lauren and Janet live here? That's when I heard Lauren's voice come from somewhere above me. Up here. I kid you not, there were like ten people standing on the staircase leading up to the other apartments, and they were all dressed in black robes. Taj and I screamed and sprinted out of there. We heard footsteps coming down the stairs after us, but the adrenaline made us way faster and we easily outran them. We ran all the way back to my dorm room, which was probably a mile, before slamming the door shut and locking ourselves inside. We called 911 and reported what happened, and 10 minutes later a cop showed up, accompanied by a campus security guard. Taj and I gave a statement, and they told us they'd check it out. When the cops went to the apartment, Lauren and the rest of the people in the robes were already gone, and the lady who lived in the apartment denied knowing anything about Lauren or Janet, or what just happened. On the last day of the fashion design class, which was just an informal party with snacks since we'd finished all the work, both Lauren and Janet were absent. A campus-wide email had gone out, so Miss Yancey was aware of the situation, and she apologized to us for what happened, even though there's no way she could have known what the girls were planning. But here's where things got even stranger. When Miss Yancey tried to look up Lauren and Janet in the system, it seemed like they weren't even students. Apparently she had just been keeping track of our grades on paper, and hadn't put things in the system yet, though to be fair, everything was pretty much a completion grade. Luckily, the story does have a happy ending, at least somewhat. The cops were eventually able to track down the two girls, who were living in another apartment on the other side of town. Lauren and Janet weren't their real names either. Unfortunately, the police couldn't really do that much, since they just had our accounts to go off of, and the people in the robes didn't actually physically attack us. They did chase us, but Taj and I hadn't looked back and couldn't give any more of a description of the incident. I'm not sure if any action was taken against the two girls for pretending to be students and attending a class, but the university was aware of the situation, and supposedly had the campus police watch out for them in the future. Unfortunately, we never found out about the whole situation, like who those people in the robes were, and what they were planning to do with us. I think the only reasonable explanation is that they were part of a cult and were trying to either kidnap us or brainwash us. However. Why those two women decided to pretend to be college students and sneak into a fashion design course is beyond me, as is why they appear to go after me specifically. In the end, I'm just glad I never found out. 
The middle school I went to participated in this Rube Goldberg machine competition each year, and I did it every year I was there. For those who don't know, a Rube Goldberg machine is something designed to accomplish a simple task in an overly complicated way. For instance, you might knock over a row of dominoes to hit a button that turns a fan on which then blows a toy sailboat across a bucket of water. There were different categories in the competition, and our school would usually send two or three teams, each with their own machine in a different category. My 8th grade year, I was the captain of the team that participated in the belts, bands, and conveyors category. I won't go over all the details, but the main idea is that we had to use a lot of objects that looped, like rubber bands, or belts that you'd wear with your pants. Starting a few months before the competition, me and the other kids who participated would meet after school once or twice a week in our science teacher Miss Bugle's classroom. I know it sounds nerdy, but it was actually a blast, especially since my best friend TJ was doing it too, and a lot of the time we had fun goofing around and experimenting. Finally the day came, and me and the rest of the teams met at the school early one Saturday morning. We carefully retrieved our machines from Mrs. Bugle's room and then loaded them onto the bus that would take us to the competition. This year it was being held at a high school about an hour away, and as this was a pretty big event lasting all day, we probably wouldn't be back until 8 or 9 at night. TJ and I and the other two kids on our team were pretty impressed with what we'd created. One of the main parts of the machine had an ace bandage wrapped around two paper towel tubes and had these circular cloth pads stapled onto it. The cloth pads were designed to carry marbles from one part of the track to another. The whole machine was mounted on this rectangular plywood board that was 3 feet by 6 feet and it took several people to carry it around. Eventually we reached our destination and the parking lot already had like 10 other buses in it. Mrs. Bugle started yelling to quiet the 6th graders down and told us to take things slow and carefully. We had to take our machines to the main check-in area, which was apparently right on the other side of the front doors. The 6th graders started talking loudly again and not really moving, and Mrs. Bugle had to tell them to hurry up. When it was our turn, TJ and I got on one side and the two other kids on our team, Ashley and Jeff, got on the other. We did our best to maneuver the giant plywood board over the rows of seats and down the aisle, then rotated it a bit to get it through the doors again. When we went through the doors, we were greeted by a group of teachers sitting at a long rectangular table who were checking people in and directing them where to go. Mrs. Bugle smiled and began talking to one lady, and she motioned to one of the hallways and told us to put each of our machines into this one specific room. So that's where we went, and looking at the other school's machines, we had some competition. In my mind, I was trying to size up if we could win or not, and though I wasn't sure, I figured we'd at least place and make it to finals. Apparently this was just a staging area, and the machines would be moved into one of the gyms nearby. Therefore, we had to stay by our machines and wait for school staff to come and get us. So Ashley, Jeff, TJ, and I sat down on the floor and started talking. A minute later, TJ suddenly stopped talking and looked up. Instinctively, I looked behind me and saw this random kid standing there. He had greasy, curly hair and was wearing a shirt with this Hawaiian overshirt thing and khaki shorts. The kid looked like he was our same age and was moderately overweight, and I'd never seen him before. Immediately I got a weird vibe from him, and I was about to say something when all of a sudden the kid pointed to our machine and said, that's against the rules. I had no idea if this kid was joking or not, so I just said, what? He continued pointing at our machine and said, you're not allowed to have that article of clothing. I looked back at TJ, Jeff, and Ashley, and they seemed as confused as I was. Jeff asked him, what clothing? And then the kid walked around us to the machine and pointed directly at the ace bandage. This is a bra. We all simultaneously burst out laughing, partly from the bizarreness of the situation, and partly because it made no sense. I expected the kid to drop the act any moment and start laughing with us, but he didn't though. Instead, he kept standing there, frowning at us. Then Ashley explained that it wasn't, in fact, a bra, but the kid didn't seem to believe us. I was starting to get creeped out and realized this kid had something going on. I actually got nervous that this kid would try to break our machine, and looking at TJ, we were on the same page. We both got up and stood in front of the guy. Then he literally screamed, you can't have a bra. <laughs> Jeff and TJ bust out laughing again, and a group of people started to gather around us. A second later, Mrs. Bugle showed up, oblivious to the situation, but quickly picked up on how weird things were. 
Then another teacher came, and before we knew it, she grabbed the kid's hand and quickly and quietly led him away. I guess that was someone from his school, but we were all left looking at each other, wondering what the hell just happened. TJ, Jeff, and I didn't quite know how to explain things, but luckily Ashley chimed in about how the kid thought we'd used a bra on our machine and then got angry. Mrs. Bugle and some of the other kids and grown-ups started laughing nervously. Eventually she took us aside and asked us for more details, but there wasn't really anything else to say. Mrs. Bugle said she'd go check with some of the other teachers and told us to stick together and tell her immediately if that kid came back. Right at that moment, two teachers from the host school showed up with a rolling cart and we helped them load up our machine and transport it to the gym. Things got back to normal and the day passed by quickly. We did several trail runs of our machine, then demonstrated it in front of a group of judges, and then walked around and looked at our other team's machines and the rest from other schools. Our team and another one from our school made the finals, meaning we'd be staying later into the evening. All the machines that made finals were moved onto the stage and then were demonstrated with the judges and everyone else watching. Low-key, it was kind of nerve-wracking doing it on stage, but miraculously no part of our machine broke. We started getting really excited that we could win. We got done with that around 5.30, and the awards ceremony wasn't until 6.30. Unlike lunch, dinner wasn't provided by the competition, but Mrs. Bugle and the bus driver took us to the Wendy's nearby. Over food, we started talking about that kid again. We weren't actually scared and never expected to see him again. It's just that the incident had turned into this huge running joke and almost an urban legend at this point. As the four of us were the only ones there when he walked up, the 6th and 7th graders kept pestering us for details. Eventually we got back on the bus and arrived just as the award ceremony was starting. Not to toot our own horn, but our team got first, and TJ, Jeff, and Ashley and I were pretty happy. Most of the reason was all the work we put into it, including restapling that ace bandage and fixing a few other parts. Some other teachers and parents came up to congratulate us afterwards, and we all started checking in with our parents and giving them an ETA for when we'd be back at our school. Now all that was left to do was load the two machines that had made it to finals back in the bus. There was a back door behind the stage that led directly to part of the parking lot, so the driver just had to pull the bus around and the teachers would help us load the machines. I volunteered along with one of the 7th graders named Jake to stay with our machines while Mrs. Bugle and the rest of our teams got back on the bus. But what happened next was straight out of a horror movie. Out of curiosity, Jake and I opened the double doors behind the stage. It was hot in the gym, and it was like 10 degrees cooler outside, so we both stepped outside while propping the doors open with our feet. I was looking out into this little alley area when Jake screamed, and the next thing I knew, an arm reached around the door I was holding and grabbed me. My body entered fight or flight mode, and I instinctively grabbed the arm and pulled a person around the door. I heard them hit the door from the other side and then fall down to the pavement. There was also the sound of something metal hitting the ground, but I couldn't immediately tell what it was. Then I realized it was the same kid from earlier. Before he could get back up, I got on top of him and pinned him to the ground. I yelled at Jake to get help, and a second later the teachers rushed outside and helped me hold the kid down. All the while, he kept screaming that, you cheated, and you can't use a bra. The guy literally kept screaming for five minutes before more people arrived, and he finally got tired. A moment later the bus pulled up and Mrs. Bugle rushed over panicking. She threw her arms around me and I told her I was okay. Then two actual cops showed up and I gave a statement. I also saw the item the kid had been holding. It was a screwdriver. At this point I wasn't really scared anymore though since the whole situation just felt surreal. The rest of the story played out like how you might expect. We got back to the school a bit later, and when we got there, all of our parents, including mine, were waiting and were pretty emotional. Mrs. Bugle apologized profusely to them, but they all knew it wasn't her fault. The school sent out an email to every single parent, there was an official investigation, and it was this whole big scene. We did end up finding out more about that kid, and as I suspected, he had some mental issues. Ultimately, it seemed like his parents were the bigger issue, though. At the end of the day, I'm just glad that kid wasn't able to harm anyone, at least as far as I know. And I don't like thinking about what would have happened if he'd managed to take me by surprise with that screwdriver.